What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week 14 of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2022 CFL season. And ladies and gentlemen, as you can tell from the thumbnail of this video, I'm mad. I'm like, I'm angry. I'm mad at myself. I'm not mad at anybody else. I'm not mad at any of you, my adoring public. I'm mad at myself because I did something stupid last week. So I originally, in my video last week, picked the Edmonton Elks to cover plus 12 and a half against Calgary in Calgary. And then I heard that Kenny Lawler wasn't going to play. And I'm like, oh my God, Kenny Lawler, he's, he's, he's Taylor Cornelius' single biggest target all season. Uh, there's no way they're going to cover this. And I went into the comments last week and officially changed the pick. I changed the pick to Calgary covering minus 12 and a half. And they won the game by eight. I'm mad at myself for not trusting my gut. And it's a great lesson. Look, I've been doing this for 11 years between the NFL and now four years into the CFL. It's a lesson I should have learned by now. But the lesson is stick with the gut. Even if you have the opportunity to do something, doesn't necessarily mean you should. I had the opportunity to change my pick. I decided to do so. And it wound up costing me a 500 week. I only went five and seven last week. I would have gone six and six if I would have just mm, and tossed it and left it alone. Even if you've been doing something for a long time, there's all still always things to learn. And uh, that was a lesson learned for yours truly. So yeah, only five and seven last week, two and two straight up, two and two against the spread or two and two over under would have been two and two against the spread if I would have left the Edmonton Calgary game alone. But only 5-7 and seven is less than 42%. It's a bad week, folks, no matter how you slice it. I am still just barely over 60% for the season as a whole at 92-61 and 61 overall. That includes 35-16 and 16 straight up and 32-19 and 19 against the spread. Had slightly better results than the previous week in CFL Fantasy Football. 76.9 points last week, and that was led by Calgary running back Kadeem Carey. Huge surprise there, right? 13 carries for 61 yards and a rush touchdown, adding 37 yards on three catches. It was good for 18.8 .8 points. Uh, four of my six roster spots, I had at least like 13 and a half points, I think. So it was a relatively balanced attack, but I did give it back on one of my wide receivers and my flex really didn't perform up to par could have been a much better week than it was but i will still take 76.9 has me at 1074.1 points overall on the season in cfl fantasy i did not move out of 11th place out of 49 in the official atlantic schooners cfl fantasy football league the leader now has 1160.8 so really interesting kind of in the context of this league as a whole that means i gained on first place by over 13 and a half points. So the top of the pool constricted a bit last week. Sometimes points were at a premium. Fantasy performances were definitely at a premium. So I did gain 13.6 points on the leader. I did, however, give back almost 16 full points to the team right in front of me in 10th place. They increased their lead on me to 17.9. So it was really close. It's now not quite as close as I'm looking to move into the top 10. That leads us straight into week 14 CFL Fantasy and my team, which is right in front of your eyes right now. And you're going to see some familiar faces from last week. We're running back Jake Mayer and Kadeem Carey at that stack for the Calgary Stampeders. And we're adding on to them Reggie Begleton. Reggie hauled in two touchdown passes last week. Probably his best game in half a season. So we're really going for as big a weapon there at wide receiver as I possibly can. And then kind of playing the value game for the rest of my roster. I'm going to roll with Devontae Williams at running back uh, for the Ottawa Red Blacks. He seems to be the um, the new Red Blacks running back of record. So we're going to go ahead and roll him out at a relatively, um, a, actually a pretty decent price. I think he's only $4,000. So if I get 10 points out of him, I feel like I've gotten my money's worth. We're going to go with Tyson Philpot as well for the Montreal Alouettes. 
a basically minimum money option for me. And he has been a decent part of the Alouettes offense the last couple of weeks, hauling in, I think, seven or eight passes total, decent yardage as well. So that allows us to grab Reggie Begleton at the top, close to the top of the wide receiver list. And then running with A.J. Willette, A.J. O., as I've affectionately called him, in my flex position, he had a really solid week last week for the Argos. I think that repeats itself again this week. So that is the fantasy lineup for week 14. Now your week 14 slate of games looks like this. The Hamilton Ticats in an absolute slide get the bye this week to try to last gasp turn their season around. And uh, people were asking me in, in, in our CFL group chat to spend a whole segment kind of ripping on the Ticats. And I'm just going to say this. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. In any case, in week 14, the Lions come off the bye to visit the Alouettes in Montreal. Toronto is in Ottawa to take on the Red Blacks. We have the rematch from last week, Saskatchewan this time in Winnipeg, taking on the Bombers, Riders, Bombers, Banjo Bowl 2022. It's always a big one. And then Calgary and Edmonton will rematch from last week, this time in Edmonton. Let's start with the Lions Alouettes game in Montreal. BC coming off of a loss two weeks ago, coming into this game off of their bye, dropping a seven point decision, 23 to 16, against the Riders. And another quarterback injury really casts the shadow of doubt on what could be the remainder of the Lions season. So you have Michael O'Connor, who of course replaced Nathan Rourke after Rourke went down for the rest of this, basically. People are now saying what I was saying multiple weeks ago, which is we're not going to see Nathan Rourke again this year. But now Michael O'Connor goes down with an um, educator, a doctor. It's a groin injury. He goes down with a groin injury. What we can say is in that game two weeks ago, neither quarterback did enough to win. The two of them, that being Michael O'Connor and and. Uh, Pipkin, Antonio Pipkin, combined to only go 15 of 32, and for those who aren't great on their math, that's less than 50%, for 206 yards passing. They did have a passing touchdown between the two of them, Pipkin adding 26 yards on six carries on the ground, and their defense kind of got beat up too. They got beat up in the run game to the tune of 164 rushing yards on 23 carries. That's over seven yards per carry. Not very BC Lions-like in that game. Now, what did I say a little bit ago? What did I say two videos ago? I said if the BC Lions get in a situation where they have a quarterback problem, either Michael O'Connor struggles or what happened was he wound up getting injured, I could see them trading for Vernon Adams. And coming out of the bye week, they traded for Vernon Adams. Vernon Adams going to the BC Lions in exchange for the Lions' first round pick in the CFL draft in 2023. And now with Michael O'Connor still limited in practice and Vernon Adams participating in full, we don't know who's getting the nod for the Lions in this game. The Alouettes saw their record drop to 4-7 and seven last week off of a a bad a punt loss to the Ottawa Red Blacks 38 to 24 they lost that game against Ottawa and that game was in Montreal so that's a rough one and they're coming off their hottest point of the season winners of two straight they were looking pretty good and then all of a sudden they turn the ball over four times and punt a very winnable game now, there was a big bounce-back showing for the run game in Montreal last week. 16 carries for a buck 45 on the ground for the Alouettes. That's over 9 yards per carry, and it was both of the running backs getting into it. Jesh Renantui and Walter Fletcher both getting into the act for the Alouettes. That's a good sign. That harkens back to a couple years ago when the Alouettes were like this low-key threat in the East Division. They were running the ball a ton. In general, it felt like a win-worthy effort for the Alouettes from top to bottom as a team. I think everybody played well enough to win that game. But when you lose the turnover battle four to nothing, and you allow your quarterback to be sacked four times and don't sack the opposing quarterback at all, you're not putting yourself in a position to win. So all of the other good stuff gets completely negated by not winning at the line of scrimmage and turning the ball over. So this is the full-on game of uncertainty this week. We don't know the Lions quarterback situation. The Alouettes are wholly inconsistent. So this is one of the tougher games, I think, to cap and pick uh, this week. 
the Lions are fresher coming off of their bye week, and I think they're objectively the better football team top to bottom. Trevor Harris could absolutely steal this football game. It is definitely a possibility, but I'm going to go ahead and lean on the BC Lions here, even though I don't know who's going to play at quarterback. I would love to see it be Vernon Adams. That would be a really interesting revenge game for Vernon if he uh, winds up getting the start. But let's take BC to get the win in Montreal over the Alouettes. On the line, Montreal is taking three and a half points here as a home underdog. Uh, I'm going to take BC to cover these points. The Lions are not only 4-0 straight up away from home this year, they're also 4-0 against the spread. They know how to win and they know how to cover away from their own building. So again, this is really probably a tough call on a team that you don't know who the quarterback is, but it's not a ton of points. Easier to cover this number in the CFL versus the NFL. So I'm going to lay the three and a half points on the BC Lions. Total in the game is 53 and a half points. It is surprisingly the largest total of the week, and I'm going to be very under on this number. I'm leaning on the defenses. I'm leaning on a lot of running because the Alouette's run defense is like the worst in the CFL statistically. So if James Butler's going to get going, this is going to be the game for him to get going. Plus, head-to-head, these two teams have gone under in five straight games. So we're going to go ahead and take under 53.5 points in BC Montreal. Let's go Lions 24, Alouettes 16. BC gets the win and covers the points. Off to Ottawa, we go for an East Division matchup. The Ottawa Red Blacks playing host to the Toronto Argos. The Argos are winners of two straight games. They will come into this game on the tail end of back-to-back road games. And they picked up a very convincing score-wise, anyway, 28-8 win in Hamilton last week. And again, they did enough to beat a third-string quarterback. I still wasn't crazy impressed with Toronto's performance. MBT threw two more interceptions. Like, they still make enough mistakes that you can't, like, you even look at a 20-point win and be like, yeah, but. Now, I was very happy to see A.J. Willette, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, get back into the game plan. He touched the ball 16 times last week for 116 all-purpose yards. And I put this on Twitter. Like, as much as I'm starting to see people really call for Daniel Adebaboye to take over at running back, the reason he's probably not going to, at least not yet, is A.J. Willette. A.J. Willette is too much of a playmaker to keep taking him out of out of place to keep the ball out of his hands. When you put the ball in A.J. Willett's hands, good things happen. 116 all-purpose yards. Good things happen when this guy's got the football. So I do want to see Daniel Adebaboye, and we will see him down the stretch this season. Look, we saw him in this game. He had three carries, turned it into 21 yards. The kid's got some explosive wheels. We're going to see him, and we definitely are, but it's not the time right now. A.J. Willett's playing too good. So obviously, kind of like I mentioned off the top, the final score in that game was not competitive. Like, Toronto won that game by 20 points. Scored points on offense, points on defense. They're one of the highest point-scoring defenses. Like, in, like they, they, their defense puts points on the board. But they make enough mistakes that I think they've earned this lack of trust that I have in them in general. That I look at them against anybody and go, do I really think Toronto's a better team than these guys? Now for the Red Blacks, they are only 3-8 and eight on the season, but they are winners of two straight games just like Toronto is. They're coming off of that 38-24 win, like I just mentioned, in Montreal against the Alouettes, and it might have been the Red Blacks' most complete game of the 2022 season. Nick Arbuckle went for 300 yards plus passing and a touchdown. They combined to run the ball 24 times for a buck 24 on the ground with a Caleb Evans rush touchdown. Jalen Acklin, welcome back to the stat sheet. Jalen Acklin, seven catches for a buck 59 through the air. He was massive. Lewis Ward, who has struggled this year kicking the ball, five for five on his field goals last week. The defense allowed 401 total yards, but generated four turnovers in that game against Montreal. Top to bottom, the Red Blacks, they put on a performance last week. You know, I totally understand it if it's tough for you to imagine a three and eight football team putting together like back-to-back complete games. Yes, they've won two straight, but to put together like top to bottom complete performances in back-to-back weeks, it's tough to say a three and eight team would do that. But look, Look at the things that they're building on. Look at the foundational pieces. The run game, winning the line of scrimmage, opportunism on defense. These are things that are 
fundamental building blocks to taking teams that aren't very good, at least not in the standings, and building momentum. The Red Blacks remain winless at home this season at 0-5, but I wanted to talk about this again because I say it every time that there's a team on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games, and you might think, okay, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it's like, you know, having to travel, again, having to travel to two straight games. So this season, teams that are on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games are 6-7 and seven straight up in those games. So in those second consecutive road games, they're six and seven straight up. Like you might think, okay, that's like 500. What is that really saying? If you take out the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, who have won everything this year except one game, and the BC Lions, take out those two teams, teams on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games are two and seven. Winnipeg has won three of these back-to-back -back road games all on their own. And of course they have, because Winnipeg has won everything this year and they're unbeaten on the road. But you take out those like top two teams in the West, basically, at least standings wise, and teams that are on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games are not finding success this year. And folks, in oh so many ways, to me, the Toronto Argos are not Winnipeg or BC. I'm taking the upset here. I'm taking the Ottawa Red Blacks at home to upset the Toronto Argos, depending on the book that you have, it's a very marginal upset or a little bit bigger, but I like the Red Blacks here. I think the Red Blacks have the momentum. I still have no faith in the Toronto Argos, really. Uh, just looking at their performances, they just do not engender faith in me. So I'm going to take the Red Blacks here. Ottawa gets the upset win at home against Toronto. Against the spread, you're probably going to find this line anywhere from plus 1 to plus 2.5 for the Red Blacks. I got it at plus 1. I like them to win outright, so obviously I'm going to take that single point against the spread. Total in the game set at 47.5, and, and I'm going to go under on this as well. I don't love this play, but head-to-head, -head, the under is 5-1 and one in the last six between Ottawa and Toronto. Uh, in Ottawa. So the uh, the last six games of these two head-to-head -head in Ottawa, sorry, five of the last six have gone under. And in the last 13 head-to-head -head overall, the under is nine and four. So it's not a great under with that number, but I'm going to go ahead and play the under there. Under 47 and a half points in Ottawa, Toronto. Let's go Red Blacks 20, Argos 17. Ottawa gets the upset win. So before I move to the back half of the week and the two rematches from week 13, I'm going to take the opportunity, as I always do, to shout out my great friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees. Ladies and gentlemen, nerdtees.ca is where you need to go to find dozens and dozens of incredible loose leaf tea blends and accessories, great gift ideas for any, any hot drink or especially tea drinker in your life, all kinds of great gift ideas. Christmas is coming, folks. Nerdtees.ca, and you want to use my promo code which is BW Finest. That is going to save you 15% at checkout on whatever you buy from nerdtees.ca, maybe including today's blend, which is Black Forest Cake. Smells like a bakery. Just got to love it. Save your 15%, and you're also going to get free shipping in Canada on any order over 100 bucks from nerdtees.ca, which is an excellent value. Or if you're one of my American viewers, you're going to get a great conversion rate on the U.S. dollar. So, nerdtees.ca, Promo code is BWFINEST, save you 15%, get your free shipping, find yourself something to love, or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on nerdtees.ca. It's an air banjo. Ding, 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 ding. Let's go to Winnipeg for the Banjo Bowl. Saskatchewan in town, Riders at Bombers. These two played each other last week, and Winnipeg came from behind to win that game 20-18. to That drops the Riders' record to 6-6, six and six, while Winnipeg, with their second straight win, moves to 11-1. and one. This was a playoff clinching win for the Bombers, and it was a gutsy comeback performance after Saskatchewan staked themselves to a 14-0 lead. However, what happened after they took that 14 nothing lead. So I was reminded, you know the movie Rounders? Matt Damon, um, John Malkovich, poker movie, right? There's a great line in that movie about how Matt Damon's character, when they're playing, he's playing heads up, and uh, he took the legs, one of his legs, one of his opponent's legs out from under him very early in their heads up matchup. And he says, now all I have to do is lean on him until he falls over. 
That's kind of what getting staked to a 14 nothing lead is like in a football game. You don't have to keep playing like it's a tie game. you got to lean on your opponent until he falls over. That's not what Saskatchewan did. Two drives in that game after going up 14 nothing of more than five plays. Like, you have to keep the football, limit the other team's opportunities. Frankie Hickson, hashtag Frankie Hickson season, he shined in that game. 18 touches for 105 all-purpose yards for the Riders. He has fallen right into that Jamal Morrow role, and he's doing great things with it. The offense moved the ball in that game. They did well, but they only finished once. It was a Cody Fajardo rush touchdown. He did not garner a touchdown through the air in that game, so they moved the ball well, but you got to finish. Now, this game still did come down to the final plays. Saskatchewan did have an opportunity late in that game. But after, you know, a 14-0 lead, it probably shouldn't have come down to the last play in the game. Once again, just situational awareness, that game awareness. Yes, there was a lot of time left, but lean on them, lean on them. It's just not what they did. For the Bombers, we saw a clean game from Zach Calaro, 63% on his passes, only 214 yards passing, but he did find the end zone twice with no picks, so it was a clean game, if not, you know, the world's greatest game statistically, and I'm hopeful for no ill effects from the Garrett Marino hit. So let's talk about this for a second, because it is a very divisive clip if you watch it in a vacuum. You have a lot of people saying this guy should never play in the league again, and you have uh, this group of people over here saying, oh my God, what does football become? So, here's the thing. I don't think Garrett Marino played in a single game this year where he didn't do something that was at least questionable. This hit was questionable, because not only was it blindside, it was after the play had already progressed towards the other side of the field, it didn't have to happen. That's the biggest thing. And especially when you blindside a quarterback, that almost never has to happen. Now, no, I didn't hashtag play the game, but chances are you can avoid that situation 99 times out of 100. I don't think Garrett Marino did very much to try to avoid that situation, and it led to him being cut. That play had to lead directly to him getting cut. He is no longer a member of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and quite frankly, that has been divisive among people as well. Look, at the end of the day, and this is a callous way to look at it, sports teams are businesses. Every player that is on a sports team, every coach, every everything, has a is an investment, and it is a re, has a return on investment. The, the ROI on Garrett Marino was not in the black anymore. Having him on the team did not pay dividends. Hey folks, uh, Bridgewater's Finest here. Um, I've never had to do this for a video before, but the audio on the back half of this week's episode got really, really bad. And uh, rather than put out a piece of content that I'm not happy with the production values of it, um, I'm just going to re-record it and I'm going to fire through uh, the rest of what I talked about in the episode. Um, the last thing I wanted to say about Winnipeg was that I thought uh, Brady Oliveira has kind of cooled off over the last couple of weeks. Only about 60 all-purpose yards a game. So I wouldn't be shocked to see them explore Johnny Augustine here over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I think you can look for him in the next couple of weeks to have a more involved role um, in the game plan. Uh, now, in terms of the pick uh, for that game, I'm going to be taking Winnipeg to win the game straight up. Uh, they're favored by six and a half points here as well. But I look at the, like, last year's Banjo Bowl was a massive blowout. I think it was 33-9 to for Winnipeg. So in this spot, they did really, they obviously had a great game last year. I'm going to lay the 6.5 points on Winnipeg. Uh, totals 44.5. I'm going to go under on it. Um, they're under five of the last six games combined this season. And 
they're 10 and 1 to the under in the last 11 head to head matchups. So even though it's 44 and a half, I'm going to stay under on it. Let's go Bombers 23, uh, Riders 10. Now for Calgary and Edmonton, uh, Calgary won last week 26 to 18. Uh, they started slow, trailed the game at halftime, were absolutely dominant in the third quarter um, to come up with a big win. Kadeem Carey, 16 touches for 98 all-purpose yards and a rush touchdown. Reggie Begleton, 57 yards and two touchdowns on five receptions. His best game since week six. Um, Calgary didn't have a great game by some metrics, but their defense was great. Six sacks, four turnovers, uh, only took one penalty for five yards. I think that's a big deal as well. For Edmonton, look, full-on apologies to Ted. And this is where I feel really bad about this because I had like... Uh, actually, a nice kind of eloquent way to put this. I apologize to Taylor Cornelius because he is very much the CFL quarterback that I said he wasn't for a good portion of last season and the beginning of this year. Over the last four games, he's generated eight touchdowns in total, four through the air and four on the ground. There's a lot of quarterbacks in this league that have not generated eight touchdowns in their last four games. So full on apologies to Taylor Cornelius. Uh, you are definitely the CFL quarterback that I said that you were not. Uh, I don't think that's going to be quite enough to put Edmonton over the top. Honestly, I like the spot for them better last week when the game wasn't at home. Obviously, they've struggled so much at home over the last little bit. I'm going to take Calgary to win this game 34-20. to So Calgary's favored by 7.5 points in Edmonton. I'm going to lay the 7.5 on Calgary. Total in the game is 50.5, so I do have it going over. I don't think it's going to fly, but they had hit five straight head-to-head -head overs prior to last week. So I do feel good about them going over on the points. So to go over the picks here with you one more time, I got BC 24-16 over Montreal, laying three and a half points on the Lions, total under the 53 and a half. I got Ottawa upsetting Toronto 20-17, to taking plus one on the Red Blacks in a game that stays under 47 and a half. I got the Bombers beating Saski 23-10. to I got the final score there. So I'm uh, taking Winnipeg to cover minus six and a half and under 44 and a half. And then I've got the Calgary Stampeders 34 to 20 over Edmonton. So laying the seven and a half points on the stamps, total going over 50 and a half. I, once again, I'm so sorry to do the episode this way, the end of the episode this way. I don't like it any more than you do, but the way the audio sounded, I, I wasn't willing to put that out as a piece of content either. That's it for me. Justin Bridgewater's finest on YouTube, blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and we'll see you again for week 15.